Have you been hearing all this noise about transformational leadership? I mean, it's all the rage for modern businesses looking for a new and better way to structure leadership within their organizations. But whatever happened to servant leadership? That was all the rage too, wasn't it? Is it defunct now? And if it's not, which one is right for you and your business? By the end of this episode, we will give you everything you need to know to make the best choice for you and your organization. So let's dive. Starting chronologically, 1970, Robert Greenleaf is the one who actually coined the term servant leadership in his essay, The Servant as Leader. Pretty spot on. Now, this was repopularized by Simon Sinek in 2014 with his New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Leaders Eat Last. Why was it so popular? Were we just kind of lost in a malaise and a funk? Were we operating off of a logical fallacy of, you know, we've always done leadership structure this way, and thus it will always be done this way? You know, the pre-servant leadership time frame, that is, when it was much more authoritarian, top-down, bottom-level leaders don't even really get to make choices. Um, and then this was something new and popularized by somebody that has the voice to do so and the the compelling narrative to create, which Simon Sinek does. He's, he's phenomenal at what he does. What Simon did was he actually brought a new light to an old philosophy, and it's become a mandatory read for a lot of organizations, even the military. I remember being in the military and we were mandated in our professional development to watch Simon Sinek TED Talks and multiple leaders, I watched them prescribe this specific book to junior leaders or to those soldiers who were on the verge of attaining a leadership rank, so specialists that are going to get promoted to sergeants and things of that nature, fresh lieutenants, people getting ready to take command, right? This is a very powerful book, so powerful that senior leaders who have been there and done that recommended this for their juniors who were getting ready to bring on the next generation into the forces. Plus, in the military, leaders literally eat last, right? So it was pretty spot on for the title. I think that maybe that's why it can't hold so well with us in the force is because it's, it's not a dictate, but it's the standard. Like you will eat last when you're in the field and you're out and you're, you're training and they deliver hot chow out to us out there, which happened maybe once a week, the leaders would stand there and outside of the line to get food and watch their soldiers go first. And once their soldiers went, then they went. And once the leaders who led the junior leaders who led the soldiers, once those junior leaders went, then those mid-tier leaders would go and so on and so forth. My my beautiful and amazing wife uh, did this hilariously at the recent like, kind of Christmas celebration. It was done at, at, at an airborne hangar an airborne hangar. I'm so, I'm just the paratrooper in me won't go away. Uh, like an air, old Air Force hangar kind of museum. There were soldiers that were going up to eat and she was in line, you know, it was, she had waited a good 45 minutes after the, the line opened that she went up in line, but there were other people that were still coming up kind of trickling in and the great beautiful soul and wonderful leader that she is stood there and let every single one of them go by. Even, you know, three people get in, she follows them, they start moving forward, another one shows up, she backs up, and she lets them go and, like, literally living this out to the most literal T, right? <laughs> so that was, it's just a testament to, yeah, the leaders do eat last, especially in the military. With all that said, eat, leaders eating last, is that is that what servant leadership is? They just make sure that your people eat before you? <laughs> what exactly is servant leadership? Essentially, it's an employee first mentality. Now, a common household name maybe for some is Richard Branson, right? He's the the CEO of Virgin Airlines and like a million other things. He was one of the one of those billionaires that sent rockets out into space or subspace or whatever you want to call it. But Richard Branson has this famous quote that I always go back to that says, "Clients do not come first. Employees come first." If you take care of your employees, they'll take care of the clients. And if we wanted to extend this, and I do, a little bit further, 
I would add, and they also take care of you, the leader, right? They, if you take care of your employees, they'll take care of the clients and they'll take care of you. Both in the essence of when they take care of clients, they are taking care of you in the organization, but also literally they'll take care of you. Like they'll make sure that that they got your back because you've got their back. So what, the, what does it look like? What do they actually focus on? Well, the servant leader focuses on the individuals on their team, right? And ensures that each of these individuals are understood by them. Like they, they take time to make sure that they, they get to know their team, they know their needs, they know their weaknesses, and, and they can support them in their times of need. So what are like the top five characteristics, right? So as stated, right, the number one is that they value people first. The second characteristic would be that they're humble. You know, they're not braggadocious. They don't self-promote. They are not the reason why things are successful. Their people are. They're also really good, active listeners. You know, they they take in information receptively, non-judgmentally, and they don't have to broadcast that, you know, that this is the case. Like, they don't have to tell you, hey, listen, here, we have an open door policy, and you're you're welcome to come in at any time. Like, they live it. They live it so thoroughly that you can just walk into their office and you will just walk into their office because you, they've established that sense of trust with you, which, which comes through living it, which is actually the next of the top five characteristics of a servant leader is trust, right? So trust, I mean, what is trust other than doing something consistently over time, right? When we establish trust, it's because we set expectations and then we fulfill them consistently with the same results over and over again and in, in even in varied situations, right? It's think of like a seatbelt, all right? You seatbelt, you trust it because every time that you hit the brakes really hard, it locks. And that one time when you hit the brakes really hard and it doesn't lock, your faith in your seatbelt just went down a whole bunch. Just one time. It just takes one time <laughs> to, to really challenge that trust game. So that's that's truly important. And that's that's a top characteristic of servant leaders is that they focus on fostering trust. But it's almost like not even as if they focus on building trust. It's just by the nature of being a servant leader, you are going to build trust because you are performing this way consistently. You're showing up for them consistently. You're, you're putting the individuals and the team first before the organizational goals, before the leader goals, before anything, you're putting their needs first consistently over time, even when it's tough. And doing that, that builds trust with them. And it also shows like the fifth one, which is caring. Not only do they listen and not only do they build trust, but they, they genuinely care, which means different things at different times, right? It means different actions in different scenarios. You know, it's, and when it comes to like the listening aspect of things, it's them, the servant leader, understanding when the person, when their individual who's who needs assistance that they're that they're serving at that time, when they're seeking actual help versus when they're just need to vent frustrations about a project. Um, they're good about communicating about that, but they they are there and so they don't they're not looking to impose their will or their perspective on the people that they that work for them, their subordinates, their employees. They're not looking to, to subjugate them. They're looking to understand and to be there and support them in these times. That's caring. With that said, the there are problems that come with servant leadership. You can imagine that if this is the way that you operate, there might be some problems. And you might build up a lot of trust and you might be consistent, but some people, some personality types, and I can say, honestly, if I'm gonna be transparent with you guys, and I try to, you know, be a little bit vulnerable, uh, I tend to go here. As I'm, I was doing research and trying to make sure that I, you know, dotted my I's and crossed my T's for this episode, I, I saw a lot of the characteristics of servant leadership in with me and my past and way that I handle um, my soldiers and my subordinates. And the risks that come with this also rang pretty true. And there's our, you know, those who are naturally inclined like myself. So don't feel bad if you're a servant leader because we're about to get a little rough. <laughs> this isn't going to feel pleasant, but, you know, we need to take our medicine. 
Uh, we need to be real. We need to be honest, even with ourselves. And so those of us that are naturally inclined, right? We didn't read about servant leadership in a book and we go, this is a really good idea. I should try and do this. But those of us who who genuinely like just have the personality traits and have the disposition that we just we just do this and it's natural for us. The, for those of us like that, you know, in this type of leadership, we're also more likely to kind of be walked on, walked over and and stepped on and, you know, treated like a doormat. And we're more likely to, I mean, simply just to be taken advantage of, you know, when it suits the needs of our employees, it creates a sort of, you know, like a, it, this whole situation can very easily get off the rails and it can create this, this entitlement or benefit state within the organization where, you know, we're, we are looking, um, like the servant leaders becoming a rescuer, like which it's, it's where we have the savior complex. Like we have to go in and save these, and we do it over and over and over again. And we become that person. And that oftentimes can allow the organizational goals, the organization and the mission to suffer in our pursuit of service to the employees. Because if we're putting so much focus on on these squeaky wheels, right? Sque the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Have you ever heard that? You know, squeaky wheel gets the oil. Uh, the the nail the nail that's standing out gets hammered down, right? It's like the thing that's the problem gets the attention. But because these ones get so reliant upon these servant leaders to solve their problems, it can create uh, a high value on like a sense of victimhood within the workplace, which is not good because it's creating an incentive structure for them to to be a victim, for them to need help because they're the ones getting the attention. They're the ones getting one-on-one -on -one time with the boss, um, even if it's just you know a team leader. You know, a leader who's always in serving mode may find themselves running from one fire to the next, to one employee problem to the next, and you know that's that's that squeaky wheel, right? That's us oiling all these things, it's putting out these fires. But what about those top performers? What about those in the middle of the pack, right? Who would perform even better that would push, right? So you have your top performers and then you have the people in the middle of the pack that if you push them, they would they would start performing more and that might even push your top performers to perform even more. But that's not happening because all of your attention is going to taking care of that bottom rung, the ones with all the problems. And it's not saying that that this is always the case and you know there are times when everybody has problems and to be there with them and to serve them like that's good like there's a time and a place but there's also a time and a place to to pull the reins back on this thing and that's actually where transformational leadership so what is transformational leadership well as advertised in its name this leadership approach is designed and centered and focuses around change or transformation Go figure. The leaders who embrace this leadership approach seek to transform or change the behaviors of individuals through influence and modification of social systems. You know, so a very common, most recent and popular expression of this in the workplace is the concept of gamification. We see this in our workplaces now more and more across industry, cross sect. Now, this is where the leader uses something external like like a public tracking mechanism or a system for performance, you know, such as like a leaderboard. You see this, uh, it's kind of, I don't know if it originated in CrossFit, but it's very big in CrossFit where you, people are putting up their records on the wall, you know, and their personal records for these different events. And you see it and you get pushed and motivated to, to beat that either to beat your own personal record or to beat the personal, the, the top records for the gym. I don't know. I don't know. That's like the extent of my, second level of uh experience with this because i've never really been to a crossfit gym i went one time i went to a crossfit gym one time and that was um by invitation from our neighbor when we were in virginia living in northern virginia and it was time for the murph and so on memorial day uh in in memory of this i believe he was a navy seal who died in combat I believe his name was murphy this last thing. i know like all the veteran friends right now listening are like oh my gosh i can't believe that you didn't know i honestly didn't plan on talking about this it just you know it's one of those things that came up so i'm rolling with it bear with me so it's a crossfit type of exercise and the idea is that you wear a flak jacket or you wear you know your vest that can carry the plates 
uh, like the plates being the actual armor that goes inside of, imagine like a vest, right? And the plates slide in. And there's different generations of these. I always had the real basic because I was never a special guy. So <laughs> we have the real basic stuff, throw them in there and it's pretty heavy. Um, I had to stop doing, there's modified, I had to stop doing it with the plates and all that because my back is in a pretty state and I'll carry all that weight like that just didn't fly anymore. So this was as a civilian, but basically what it is is that you would wear those uh, or not. And then you would run one mile, then you would do 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, and 300 air squats. And you could do that in any, so once you complete the one mile, you could complete those three exercises in total amount in, in whatever fashion you desire. You could do one pull-up, two push-ups, and three squats like a hundred times, right? <laughs> you could do it that way. Uh, I don't think anybody that I've ever done it with has. I typically, what I would do is I would do 10 sets. So I would do 10 pull-ups, 20 push-ups, and 30 air squats. So I would do that 10 times. And then you run another mile, which is the most hilarious mile you've ever run. If you haven't done this and and you are inclined uh, that are physically demanding and that push yourself, which I think that we all should, I highly recommend this. Memorial Day is coming up. This is the day. And you're going to see hilarious your run is. It, it's like running with like, like jello legs with cinder blocks as feet. It's just, it's so funny. Um... And this comes from a person that doesn't train for the for the Murph or stuff like that all the time. So my out of shapeness shows on those days, and it's coming up right around the corner, Memorial Day. Let's go. Okay, so that was my one experience in a CrossFit gym, but they use that right as I stated for motivation. So now workplaces, you can see like they're putting up whiteboards in their offices. They're putting up large screens. They'll even feed it with live information that shows like for a sales team. They'll put it up. You know, put this giant screen in front of the entire sales team's office with their numbers that are getting live updated in accordance with their performance. That is the gamification and that is a strategy to create social changes like social norm changes through measurement that can be seen as a type of transformational leadership. Now you might already have a bad taste in your mouth but the thing is just like servant leadership there's a time and a place. So I want to lay this out and be really fair. So ideally transformational leadership transforms followers into leaders and in the ideal state that's what's happening so even if you just change somebody from a follower into a leader who leads themselves more effectively than they were before this is this is transformational leadership you're making change this person is now proactive they're thinking about the next steps they're thinking about what they can do next and what the next part in kind of like the flow is for them, or maybe it's repetitious, maybe it is sales. Maybe they just gotta get on their next sales call, right? And so they're motivated like, oh, I'm I'm good. I know, I just gotta keep the momentum up and like I'm leading myself. I don't have to wait to be told to do this by my leader. I know what I gotta do. And so creating that type of change in an individual is transformational leadership. And through this transformation, the business will see improvements due to the increased levels of motivation and the increased levels of engagement in the workplace, right? That employee engagement that everyone talks about, that's how we get this increased. Um, but it's not just whiteboards, leaderboards, and you know, this gamification. In contrast to servant leaders, you know, transformational leaders, they thrive on personal growth and development. Leaderboard and gamification is just one way to get there. They spend their time understanding their strengths and weaknesses, and they, they create game plans. You know, how do they optimize for strengths? How do they reduce their weaknesses? How do they eliminate some weaknesses? You know, some things you can't change about yourself, but a lot of things you can. And so you focus on your sphere of control, what's your sphere of influence? What can we change? You know, but the transformational leaders, they'll, they'll consciously take time to set their goals. More importantly, they'll reflect on them. They'll actually look back. So this isn't just blazing ahead guns out, you know, a whole nine yards at the side of a Blackhawk. This is more thought out. It's more nuanced. It's it's not just hard charging motivational speeches, but it is that too, right? So <laughs> it's the goal is the higher calling. The organizational goal is the higher calling. Now, characteristically, transformational leaders are charismatic. They're enthusiastic. They actively engage with the employees to motivate. Like I said, think inspirational leader. They'll use techniques like, like we talked about with the leaderboards, but they'll also use things like future casting. So what, 
what in the world is future casting um future casting is where they can they will help an employee see their desired future and they'll they'll help them see that through the lens of like how is that achievable through the work that they're doing within this organization how does your success in this organization tie to your personal success how does that personal success tie to organizational goals that's what transformational leaders do right they they tie those together to create a stronger sense of motivation because they tie it to your core who you are which means that they still need to know who you are right so what are we talked about some of the core characteristics of servant leadership but what are the characteristics of a transformational leader well they've been written out there's a bunch of different writings on this and you can look in and there's different ways that they list these and categorize them but i really like this one these five c's of transformational leadership clarity is the first one. our first c in clarity so i'm actually looking at the fielding graduate university site here and they break down the five c's of transformational leadership and they list here under clarity we're talking about vision so your ability or the propensity for a transformational leader to communicate about the vision and values they even talk about transparency right so to communicate about these things in a transparent manner but also to discuss other things in transparent manners like pay potential looming layoffs all the good news all the bad news this is about building trust within the organization and that's what transformational leaders do through the sea of clarity so the next c is confidence and that's particularly poignant when it comes to transformational leaders because a word that tends to be synonymous with transformational leadership is charisma right it's motivating and riling up the troops and maybe not riling up creating enthusiasm around an idea around the mission about tying people to the organization that's what you're it's hard to tie people to an organization if you didn't take the first c into account where you're very clearly articulating what are the values what are the vision of this organization now people can tie to it but if you don't have confidence in your presentation of this it's not going to go very well. I'm like, oh, I guess I think the company is looking at they focus on this or like we environments. They think it's pretty important. They think that employee rights are it's a big deal to them. So <laughs> communicating like that is not very confident. It does not instill confidence. But this isn't just a confidence is not just this. It also extends to as a, they have it listed out and you can see faith and self it's funny so they just basically substituted confidence with faith <laughs> and so i don't think that that's actually the most appropriate word i think that faith is a belief without without kind of justification there's a not without justification but there's there's an area that you have to jump over like you have to have faith that this is going to happen even though I don't have a lot of evidence backing up I can't show you tangible objective metrics that back this up hence like faith in God there's not a lot of metrics like tangible evidence that's ah yes God left his ring so it's a different thing when you're talking about faith so I don't agree with the fielding graduate university their use of this I think it was a lazy way but maybe they have some sort of a justification for it that I'm not seeing but essentially what they're saying is you want to have confidence in your in yourself right you want to understand you want to be able to look back on what you've done and understand your capacity to act that way in the future and to perform well in the future based on what you've done and based on what you know and what you've learned and skills that you're developing right this is that self-confidence and it's the same thing when you're looking at confidence or like they say faith in team faith in partners it's the same thing right i have confidence in my team to perform because i've assembled the team or the people have volunteered and they're leveraging their individual character strengths and their skill sets and experience towards this in a way that makes this team functional right then i don't have i don't have faith in this team i have confidence in this team i just i think that they wanted to avoid the like the redundancy of saying confidence in this guy oh, don't use the word in the definition we're not trying to define confidence i think we all have a baseline understanding of what that means and yeah no it goes right into that capability skills wisdom trust that's exactly what we talked about so that's confidence the next c is connection and this one holds a special place in my heart for those of you that aren't familiar i've actually established a new 
leadership approach called connected leadership that we're going to talk more about later. But for now, connection through the lens of transformational leaders is, as listed by Fielding, again, we're looking at inclusion, congruence, alignment, empathy, and compassion. I think that there's, I, you're, if you know me at all and you've been following the content, you know that I have particular special feelings about inclusion. I think that it's important to delineate. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's not the purpose of the show, but I just think that it's important to understand the power of exclusion and the power of inclusion. And there's a time and place for both of those. The people, the, the, those working within your organization should feel included. You've the exclusivity is being a member of this organization and that should be exclusive right it should you should feel there should be connection based on the fact that you're representing this organization and its name and there's pride in working there right that's that is exclusion and that's really good once you're in then yes we're looking at that connection. We're looking at making sure that we're taking actions as leaders that are inclusive, that are not leaving people out of the fold for any reason, because they think something different, because they look something different, we, because they come from somewhere different. It doesn't matter. The point is, once you're in, we let you in the circle, then you're in the circle. You got to really be in. And so if people aren't let in, then it ruins that sense of connection. A transformational leaders will also look at like a congruence, right? Alignment. So these things, I think the empathy and the compassion were highlighted really well during COVID in the sense that we were brought more into each other's homes as remote work became more prominent and continues to remain prominent. A lot of people are going back to work at least in some capacity for some amount of days. There, remote work is more prominent now, and it's not, well, the percentages might wane and go up depending on the circumstance, the organization, the industry. It is going to stay. So you just, you have to know that, and you have to be able to operate within the new space that we now live in. But it was interesting because COVID, like I said, it brought us into each other's homes in a way that wasn't really there before, and... It also opened up conversations about deeper things inside of people's homes, like understanding what the risk factors were for family members and being able to open up the lines of communication around that. And that is, I think that's the, one of the critical parts about this connection is your ability to communicate. So having empathy, having compassion, being able to look at your people and, and extend these things and have these characteristics, these almost like sub characteristics of a transformational leader. This is critical for them in that regard. Moving on, we see commitment, right? And so this is a particularly interesting one because the sub bullets are critical. We're looking at commitment to these sub characteristics or these sub bullets here, or a commitment to purpose, commitment to people, commitment to the principles and commitment to performance. So that's a little bit different than the other ones where they're explanatory um, in nature, but these are like definitive. <laughs> they define <laughs> the type of commitment that we're talking about. This is taking the component of clarity and pushing it one step further, right? So we know the vision. It's been clearly explained what the vision, what the values are, but what about like the purpose what this is almost like you have your vision statement and your mission statement and so now we're looking at the mission statement this is the the how we're going to get things done or the vision and now it's saying purpose so it's like why are we getting it done so to me i see it as a little bit of intermixing here but the most critical part about this is that there is again clarity here in this commitment to what the principles are, right? We needed to be able to explain those. Our principles should be based on our values. They're the values lived out. And that's the way the purpose is too. The purpose is the vision lived out. Ultimately, what the transformational leader needs to be doing here is having a commitment to their people. And that's actually where 
I believe some flaws lie in transformational leadership. And that is, it's a certain sense of reach and it's a certain dependence upon characteristics of individuals to be able to carry this out. Like you have to be this type of person. You have to be that charismatic leader that, that can rally the troops and that can motivate your team. And the reach of this is very centralized. Like your sphere of influence only really goes out. And this is per actual like studies and experiments that have been done. The effectiveness of this really only extends to those people you're directly leading. So it doesn't impact those not under your leadership. So you have to, if you want transformational leaders and you want a transformational leadership style within your organization, you have to get all of your people have to be able to live out these characteristics. Now, not everyone needs to be charismatic in the same way, but you're going to have these different flavors. And that's where we get into some of the next part of transformational leadership. The next C, creativity. So there's a huge long, this is the like the longest list or the most amount of words, the most full little diamond <laughs> that we're looking at here is creativity here under the Fielding Graduate University. Again, this is where these five C's are coming from. And for perspective or for context, this appears to be written in conjunction or as a response to COVID specifically. So a lot of, they break down each of these in their own way, which is not exactly how I'm breaking them down. I'm looking at it at a more holistic, generalizable perspective. But they're in the article, when they break down each one of these, they're looking at that. And so you can find that at fielding.edu slash transformational dash leadership, but I'll try to remember to throw this in the show notes. <laughs> Don't be too mad if it's not there, but it's not too hard to look up. So creativity, they're talking about innovation. And so that's interesting. Innovation can be creative, but to me, it's like, it's leaving out the how, and I don't particularly like that, but I guess we're just looking at kind of the characteristics. This, to me, that's more of an output of creativity and not an element of it, which I think is why it's counterintuitive to me. Lateral thinking, systems thinking, diversity of thought, risk-taking, continuous improvement. So. I love the diversity of thought here, and that's where I was speaking a little bit on the inclusion component earlier, is that I don't care about the way that people look in my organization, in my business. Like, I don't care who my graphics editor is. I don't care who is the head of marketing. I don't care who's making the calls. I don't care what they look like. I don't care really what they sound like. It is irrelevant to me. It's more relevant. Can you get the job done? But And can you do it effectively? Now, when we're looking at the more creative components of the business and not just, I don't know, like slamming rivets in the side of a car door, but if I'm having a marketing team or I'm having a marketing meeting with this team, I don't want five different people there who are from that are black, that are white, that are Latino, that are Asian, that are every single Russian, that are every single walk, but they all actually grew up in downtown Manhattan and all went to the same school <laughs> because that can be a real thing because we're America. And so I, especially if they're like several generations removed from their heritage and it's, they're just American. That's cool. I don't have a problem with, with that, but I think the point of the diversity of thought, which absolutely enables higher levels of creativity and more effective uh, end results, if you're able to synthesize this effectively, is when you have different people from different perspectives because they can look at the same message that you're trying to put out. Again, if we're following this marketing theme, they can look at this from different angles based on their experience. Ah, that's not really gonna hit with, with my, like the segment of the population that I'm familiar with. This, that's maybe we create another one, right? And we create another ad or we create another marketing graphic or we shoot another video and we touch on this specifically. And so I think that's, I think that's brilliant to be able to account and, and that's perspectives. There's so many perspectives out there that I'm not going to have and that we're going to be able to have a lot more creative production with these different perspectives. And 
there's actually an interesting story <laughs> that I have about creativity when it comes to transformational leaderships or a failure of creativity. If we look at this from the perspective of leadership in the scope of education, let's say for instance, I'm not pulling this from any personal experience, certainly not. <laughs> Wink, nudge, nudge. The, if you are a teacher and your purpose is to get students engaged, let's say you're a professor at a university, I don't know, maybe on Long Island. And you're, you have an in-person class and they, and part of the grading scale is participation. And so the idea is if something's graded, you're wanting to encourage high degrees of performance. You want to encourage more engagement in class if participation is graded. Does that make sense? You want to see that people are engaged, that they're learning the topics and the materials and that all makes sense. But what happens if you only have four people out of a class of 35 who ever participate? It's, I feel that the lazy and most common answer to this is saying, you had your opportunity, you just had to raise your hand and participate. If you're a transformational leader and you're embodying transformational leadership in your teaching approach, you're going to look at ways to be creative. What are other ways that I can get people to engage? What's the problem with the current engagement? Now, when you're establishing connection and empathy with your people, you're going to learn more about them. And you're going to understand that some people don't feel confident to raise their hand. Maybe they would feel more confident communicating in a small group setting. So maybe instead of having to raise your hand and voice your opinion in front of a group of 35, maybe you create some opportunities where you have some breakout groups. And then the breakout groups are all answering a question that's posed by the professor and that they can elect a representative during that. And maybe you do this so frequently that you keep the same groups and each person rotates so that a person, yeah, you're still gonna speak in front of class because you have to confront your fears in some way, shape or form. And it's important to build confidence to speak in front of people as you are heading out to be a professional in the real world. So we want to expose you to that, but you have your group, you've communicated with them, you're getting confident with them, and then you're just expressing kind of the summation of those thoughts, right? That's another way. There's a bunch of ways that you can do this. You can walk around to each of the groups and listen to the conversations that are happening and pay attention to the people that are participating in the group discussion because that's still participation and that's exactly what you want. So there's ways to do this and you can look at this in each field, but the idea is you want to increase performance. You want to enhance engagement. That's the purpose of transformational leadership. So what does your organization need? What can you provide naturally by your own character traits and personality traits? You know, maybe you're not super charismatic. Your attempts at being a motivational leader would most likely just come off as disingenuous. That's a risk. You know, you got to consider that, you know, what if you're inclined to serve others like me? And maybe that's even how you got into positions of leadership you know, like me <laughs> and then your subordinates once you get into that position of leadership your subordinates start to use you and they the standard that you've created over time and they rely on you to solve their problems while at the same time now upper management is also expecting you to solve their problems which are the organizational goals fulfill your duties and your obligations you know and achieve those mission statements to achieve those goals set by the organization. This is where the new form of leadership comes into play. You know, rather than falling to the whims of your own personality traits, you can rise to the effectiveness of the most powerful system for leaders that has ever existed. I mentioned earlier that we were going to dive deeper into the idea of connection and the role that this plays for you as a leader in the workplace. Now, that is exactly what we're going to do. 
I'm going to unveil the system to you, the system of connected leadership that does not rely on you to be charismatic and it does not leave you prey to that rescuer effect of servant leadership. So right now, go check out the next video where I discuss what connected leadership is, how it works, and my full plan to release the entire system to you principle by principle over the next month or so. And the system's so robust that we're going to dive into such detail with practical strategies for you to start making an impact today. Each part will be released week by week. So if you're catching this live or shortly after it's aired, you are going to be able to kind of follow along with the live release of each of these completely free to you all on this YouTube channel.